Uh, my name is Gus Mazaka. I'm the uh, chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and the director of the New England Musculoskeletal Institute. Uh, tonight we're talking about innovative treatments for uh, back and leg pain. Uh, this is obviously a condition that uh, uh, afflicts many of us. Uh, and uh, we have uh, tremendous uh, faculty both in orthopedics and neurosurgery here uh, that treat this in a very unique way, uh, minimally invasive, uh, and that we perform this uh, more than anybody in the state of Connecticut right now, so we're very proud of, uh, of what they bring. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, living legend, Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, Dr. Bill Walton, or not Dr. Bill Walton, but in my eyes is Dr. Bill Walton. Uh, which is uh, really quite a, a thrill uh, for many of us. And uh, it's just a pleasure to have him here interacting with uh, our people today. And uh, it was a terrific uh, visit by him. I'd like to thank a few people, uh, Sean Murphy and his uh, team, Nuvesa, for co-sponsoring the event, uh, Chris Kaminsky, Ann Horbatuck, Lisa Cianchetti for assisting with the setup of this event, um, a little detail about the, uh, or a plug really, uh, for the Musculoskeletal Institute. We have four areas, uh, orthopedic surgery, we have an osteoporosis center, uh, rheumatology, and a, and a world famous comprehensive spine center. Uh, we have both non-operative physiatry uh, for care of uh, back and leg arm pain, as well as uh, tremendous uh, minimally evasive safe, patient-centered surgeons uh, to perform surgery only when it's needed. Uh, this center was recognized uh, as a Blue Distinction Center by Blue Cross and Blue Shield for their expertise in safe and efficient, cost-effective delivery of quality specialty care, which is a great honor. Uh, they see people here in uh, Farmington and in Southington. So for tonight's program, I'm going to introduce Dr. Anuke who's the director of the Comprehensive Spine Center. Uh, he will then uh, be the uh, master of ceremonies for tonight. Uh, then obviously we'll hear from uh, Bill Walton and then we'll have a question and answer session. So uh, we're gonna go straight through with the program. And uh, once again, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming and uh, uh, supporting this terrific event. Dr. Anuke. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, I think this is the most um, auspicious event, and I hope we'll learn from it today. So to kick off, um, I'll be introducing Dr. Isaac Maas, who is a fellowship-trained and spine surgeon and assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and a member of the Comprehensive Spine Center in the New England Musculoskeletal Institute. Dr. Maas completed his residency in the renowned University of Toronto, which is in fact where I did my residency a few years ago, many years ago. And he was awarded the Lawson Family Postgraduate Fellowship as a department's top graduate. After completion of his residency, Dr. Moss received specialized training in advanced spinal deformity and general degenerative disc disease of the spine at the Rush Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Moss' clinical focus is on the treatment of all disorders of the neck and back. He has specific interest in clinical and research conditions of the spine. He particularly likes the use of minimal invasive approach to spine ailments. Dr. Moss also has a master's degree in biomedical engineering, and he has had several awards and scholarships for his involvement in research to develop novel biologic therapies for intervertebral disc degeneration. He's a member of the North American Spine Society, as well as the Orthopedic Research Society. So please, I welcome Dr. Mars to come and give us this talk on the use of this particular um, spine procedure. Dr. Mars. Thanks, Dr. UK. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I know you came to hear me, but please stay for Bill afterwards, because he'll feel bad if you all leave. So um, thank you for that lengthy introduction. You know, we're all here now to talk about back pain and leg pain. And so this is, an, you know, uh, we have maybe 150 uh, people in the room, but this really affects uh, almost 85% of Americans at some point in their life. And um, 
Some of this is chronic, some of this is acute, but it's really almost a ubiquitous problem. And it costs our society huge amounts of money. We'll hear from Bill's story how it really can change your life and really put you out of commission. And this is what we're trying to solve. Just as a bit of background, this is what a normal spine looks like. This is a disc when we look at it from the front. And um, this is the spinal cord or the nerves of the spine. And they're supposed to have a lot of space. And those nerves will exit the spine and go out uh, towards your legs if they're in the lumbar spine and in the, in the low back or towards your neck if it's in, uh, or, or towards your arm if it's, uh, if it's in the neck. This is an MRI, which you guys, hopefully, um, all of you have an MRI that looks like this. It's completely normal. We see uh, a side view here where the discs are nice and healthy with this white sort of cushiony center. These are the shock absorbers of your body. And as you walk, they're really absorbing the shock as you go along. And um, they have a nice fluid-filled center and uh, a fibrous ring on the outside with lots of space for the nerves um, that we see here in the MRI. This is what happens as we walk every day. Up and down, the discs are constantly those shock absorbers. And over time, these things do tend to degenerate or wear out, just like every other joint of our body. For some people, this is very quickly. For some people, this is very slowly. Uh, but it happens to everybody. Sometimes it causes pain, but most of us have this and never actually know it, which is a great thing. And usually, you don't really need much in terms of treatment um, for this problem. But what can happen sometimes, you get these bone spurs that develop, and the nerves can get pinched. And that leads to something called spinal stenosis. And spinal stenosis is uh, literally um, means that there's not a lot of space or not enough space for the nerves. And you can see as the disc wears out in this animation, um, you get bone spurs. The discs actually lose their height a little bit. And you lose the space. The nerves get pinched um, as you walk and as the discs collapse. And sometimes this is asymptomatic, but sometimes this can be a lot of uh, painful in the, either in the back or running down your legs. Usually people have worse pain when they're walking, better when they're sitting, but not everybody follows this, this uh, sort of pattern. And again, this is just the normal healthy spine where you have a big high disc uh, with lots of space for your nerves. And here's a worn out spine where you can see the nerves get pinched. And uh, the MRI, remember before we saw that big uh, center where there was a lot of that white stuff, space for the nerves. Here, you don't really see very much space. Uh, Spondylolisthesis is another thing that can happen. This means the slippage of the spine where actually one bone slips forward on the other. And um, this happens, again, as a normal part of aging, um, but sometimes can lead to very significant symptoms. And again, an MRI here where you see really, I mean, it doesn't take uh, a lot of training to figure this out. Here is one of the building blocks of the spine, the vertebrae. Here's another, and they're not quite lined up. And again, what happens behind that where the nerves are, or you can see over here, there's not a lot of space for the nerves, and you have spinal stenosis or pressure on the nerves, you get very similar symptoms. The back pain, leg pain, and uh, it can be quite debilitating. So some people have back pain. Some people have what we call radiculopathy, which is the pain that shoots down your legs, usually because the, uh, the, spine is, the nerves in your spine are being pressed. Um, sometimes this can happen, a lot of people call it sciatica, that's what's referred to as sciatica. This can happen acutely, so it comes and goes very quickly, or in some people it can actually last for a long time. Sometimes it's constant, that it's there all the time, sometimes it comes and goes depending on what you're doing. So this is what everybody's saying now. <laughs> it's a plug for my son. So, um, you know, this is, that sounds pretty scary because this happens to everybody at some point in their life. So the question is, if you're going to go see a spine surgeon, are you going to have to have surgery? You know, this is sort of a scary thing. Uh, the truth is probably not. 90% of people with spine problems do eventually get better on their own. Usually, uh, it's just a matter of a little bit of rest and then getting back to activity, uh, strengthening your core, doing lots of aerobic activity, keeping yourself in good shape, keeping your weight down, not smoking. All these things will cure your back pain in most of the cases. Surgery really is a last resort. Um, so how do we decide who needs surgery? We look for red flags. So meaning sometimes, uh, you know, not, it's not just pain, but other things can be going on. People have neurologic deficits. They're, they're numb in their legs. They're weak in their legs. Uh, they're having problems with their bowel or bladder function. People have fevers. People have weight loss. That might mean they have something else going on, maybe an infection, maybe a tumor, God forbid. Um, or if they're involved in trauma where they actually break their spine. So these are people that often uh, or maybe a higher likelihood to, ha to need surgery. Then um, we have to figure out if you have leg pain, obviously there's a lot of, there are a lot of different reasons to have leg pain. Maybe it's your hip, maybe it's your knee. So we have to figure out, is it actually coming from your spine? Um, then we look and look at your MRI, we look at your imaging, does everything match together? So we always look to see if you have leg pain in a certain part of your leg, does that match the, pro the place in your spine where the pathology is? 
And then the most important question is, has there been adequate course of non-operative care? And as Dr. Mazaka mentioned, you know, we're not in the business of going out there and trying to operate on every single person that comes through our door. I probably will only operate on maybe one out of 20 or even 30 people that I see because um, most people will get better given the right treatment. And often there's just a bit of advice you can give people. So changing a bit of their lifestyle, changing the way they exercise, and they can often get better on their own with some help uh, from their doctor. But when that does fail, there are things to do. So I sort of think of it as a ladder. The most simple thing to do is exercise, get in good shape, and uh, you'll feel better. Sometimes we need some medications that could be as simple as an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory. Sometimes there's more uh, stronger prescription medications. When those don't work, we do spinal injections sometimes. And some of you may have heard of an epidural injection. They put cortisone, which is an anti-inflammatory, right around the nerves of your spine and can really take away a lot of your pain. Now, I skipped a step because just because you haven't, you've done all these things that hasn't worked doesn't mean you need or should have surgery. Uh, but sometimes when these don't work and you really are debilitated because of your pain, you will think of having surgery. And surgery comes in different flavors. Um, the most uh, sort of simple thing would be maybe a discectomy if you take out a herniated or a slipped disc. A laminectomy means you take away that spinal stenosis, those, uh, those uh, bone spurs that are pressing on the nerve. Or when you have some instability, like that slip spine that I showed you, you may need to do a spinal fusion. And you can do that through a variety of approaches. And that's really what we're going to talk about. Uh, just in terms of other surgeries, something like a microdiscectomy, that's when you have a herniated disc, you have sciatica or pain shooting down your leg. This is sort of, of all the things we do, probably the most straightforward procedure, where all we have to go is through little tiny incisions, we can do it through a, a one, uh, one inch incision, go take out your fragment of herniated disc, shave away that piece that's pressing in your nerve, you go home the same day and have a, que and have a, uh, a quick recovery. Um, another thing we do sometimes is called the spinal decompression. So that's where we actually go and take away those bone spurs that are pressing on your nerves when you have spinal stenosis. This is a bit of a long animation, but at the end of the day we go and we can actually shave away the bone spurs in your back uh, to make more space for your nerves. And once again, uh, this is usually uh, can be done as an outpatient or maybe a one night stay in the hospital and a pretty quick recovery. When that's not enough, so when you have an MRI that looks like this, so here there is spinal stenosis in this part of the MRI where the nerves are pinched, but there's also, you can see these bones don't really line up properly. So just ta making more space for your nerves is really not going to be the ticket here. You need to do something that will regain the stability and the alignment of the spine. And that's what we do call a spinal fusion. So a spinal fusion is we're literally almost welding the two bones together. We take away the joints, we take away the discs, we take away the facet joints at the back of the spine, and we actually put bone graft, and it's like we're tricking the spine that is broken so that it heals into one piece. Traditional way of doing this is with uh, screws and rods. So you go in through the back of the spine, you actually have to peel the spinal muscles off the back, and then we uh, put in the bone graft that we said, and we put in these pedicle screws like this and some rods to hold the spine together. Um, again, this is a little bit more invasive. Uh, the recovery takes a little bit longer, usually spending two or three days in the hospital. And then we need to let those bones heal, and that takes uh, weeks to months. And uh, I usually tell my patients, you're probably going to hate me before you love me when you have this because it is a painful operation. The results can be very good at the end of the day, but there is getting over that hump of the initial surgery. The question is, is there a better way to do this? And uh, spinal surgery has been around for a, a long time, but probably over the past 10 years or so, it's really been evolving. Um, it, uh, it, a philosophy has evolved is maybe we can do the same thing um, but make less collateral damage. You know, like I said, when you go to the traditional spinal fusion, you're taking all that muscle off the spine in order to get down to do your work. Wouldn't it be nice if we can do the same thing, but leave those muscles intact, and then get people up and walking better, having less uh, post-operative pain, and again, back uh, to their regular activities faster. So uh, that's what minimally invasive surgery is. The uh, one caveat is, and you know, both myself, Dr. Nuk, Dr. Zangu at the Spine Center, we do do minimally invasive surgery, but we also do the traditional surgery because this is not right for everybody. And uh, what I was always taught and what I like to tell people is you can do a minimally invasive surgery, but it has to be maximally effective. So if you can't achieve the goals you need to do, there's no point in having a small incision because your patient's not going to be, you're not going to be happy if you had a small scar, but your pain was still there, that's not making anybody happy. So the first thing that we need to do is really figure out, can we achieve the same goals with less collateral damage to the rest of your tissues? And uh, this is why uh, I've sort of started doing a lot of this, what's called uh, XLIF or extreme lateral interbody fusion, because really it's one of the ways where we can achieve the same goals. We can realign the spine, we can make space for nerves, but do it with less of this collateral damage. This is one kind of minimally invasive fusion that we do. 
Um, and again, this is sort of different. Instead of going through the back, we actually go in through the side. And this is uh, the incision. You have about a three or four centimeter incision right on the side in your flank. And uh, we can go down to the spine and uh, take out the disc and uh, reestablish the, uh, the height of the disc, reestablish the space for the nerves, but again, not disrupting that very sensitive and painful paraspinal muscles that we have. Um, it's made safe with a couple of different technologies, and I'll go through them in a minute. One of the main ones is a nerve monitor monitoring technology where we can actually look where the nerves are in our operative field and make sure that we avoid them before they get injured. Uh, and again, this is just what the traditional surgery would look like, where we'd have to go up. And this is all those muscles that we peeled off the spine in order just to get down there, whereas here, really going through a very uh, a small incision, less painful way to get to do the same job. This is that uh, neuromonitoring device that I've talked about. And what this is, is a, a computer and a unit, and then we put some needles into the, into the patient while you're sleeping, so you'll never know what happened. Um, if anyone's ever had an EMG or a nerve conduction study, very similar, small little needles that actually go right into the uh, muscles. And what we do when we're doing the surgery is we stimulate, we look for nerves in our operative field where we're doing the surgery. And if we see that we're getting twitches in the muscles, then we say, okay, we gotta sort of figure out a different path, move our retractors away, try to figure out a better way to do this. And this is a very safe, reproducible, effective way of doing the surgery without injuring any nerves. It's been used in over 100,000 surgeries and this number is climbing every day. This is uh, just a little bit of demonstration of what the X-lift surgery is. And uh, again, extreme lateral interbody fusion. And um, you'll be um, patient, uh, the patient is uh, positioned on their side. And uh, again, so sleeping on your side. And we go down, we make a very small incision right over, you use x-rays obviously to, uh, to uh, localize exactly where to go. We make a very small incision in the side. I guess I'm faster than the video. And then, um, you see here, this is that neuromonitoring thing. So as we're going down, we, gotta make, we have to make a portal to get down to your spine. And each one of these called dilators, which actually opens up the space to get there, each one of them is attached to that nerve monitoring system. And that allows us to uh, safely get down to the spine. Then we work the entire surgery through this, through this tube. So again, that's about a three or four centimeter incision as opposed to a big incision in the back. And working through this tube, we go and we take out the disc, just like we were doing from the back of the spine, actually, but doing it now through the side. And in fact, it's a bit easier because you have more access to it. And we can put in these uh, large implants. And so you can see before you have a disc that's collapsed, and when the implant is in, and this is, again, it's, uh, it's called uh, peak, which is a plastic. Um, and inside we put bone grafts so that those bones will weld together just like the traditional surgery. But the nice thing is we can reestablish the height and again make more space for nerves. I don't think we want to watch that again. Um, so again, the XLIP procedure is less disruption to tissue. You lose, you know, a tablespoon or two of blood during this procedure and uh, we are very safe with the neuromonitoring. People will get up and, walking fa get up and walk faster, they'll get out of the hospital faster and uh, again back to normal activity which is the goal of this, of this entire process. Is it right for everybody? No, it's not right for anybody. For everybody, this is uh, one of the uh, ways, uh, one of the indications, spondylolisthesis, when you have that slippage of the spine, and uh, what you can do again is putting that uh, spacer inside. When you reestablish the height of the disc, it also puts the spine back into alignment, and uh, makes space for the nerves. This is one of uh, my patients. You can see here. Um, this is a side view of the spine. The um, the disc is collapsed. The spine is slipped forward, and we put this device in. You can see. The space, this is where her nerve had to come out from before. Once we're finished, look at the space available for that nerve. I mean, you don't have to be a doctor to figure that out. Um, you know, that took away her pain. And again, out of the hospital in one or two days and back up and walking. Another thing we often do surgery for is something called scoliosis. Now, most of you think of scoliosis as something that adolescent uh, people, you know, adolescent girls usually get. Those are the big curves of the spine. I know our daughter just got tested for it in school, I think. Um, but this is different. This is called degenerative scoliosis. Degenerative scoliosis is something that's going to happen to about 60 or 70 percent of the people uh, in this room at some point. And that's where you develop a curve in your spine as a result of the discs collapsing. And uh, when that happens, just like with the spondylolisthesis, thesis, the nerves can get pinched and uh, they can ha people can have a lot of pain. So this is something that I love to do uh, because uh, this is where you really see the benefit of this type of procedure. Traditional surgery for scoliosis usually involves a huge incision from the uh, you know, stem to stern where you have to go down and really expose all these vertebrae because again, a lot of people have only a one level problem. 
So doing the open surgery maybe isn't such a big deal. But when you're talking about four or five levels that need to be fused to be realigned, that's really a huge operation. Lots of blood loss, lots of post-operative pain, hard to get back and going afterwards. So this is, I think, where it's a bigger operation where you get the maximum advantage of some of these uh, of, of minimally invasive procedure like this. So again, here you can see one of my patients. You can see this curve of the spine. Uh, and right over there, the nerves were being pinched, and this patient, uh, this uh, woman, had really uh, horrible pain. She was a teacher, couldn't work, took six months off of school, and was really debilitated. She tried everything else, like we said, did physical therapy, did uh, medications, did injections, and really wasn't getting better. Came to see me, and we discussed her various options, and we uh, decided to have uh, an X lift. This was done over three levels, and you can see uh, the before and after. It's really remarkable, and for me, it's a very rewarding thing because I can see this happen in the operating room as you're doing it, you just know the patient's going to feel great uh, when this is done. So again, is the XLIF right for you? It's not, uh, every patient is different. Not all pathology can uh, be addressed with any single approach. And that's really what our commitment is at the uh, UConn Musculoskeletal Institute. We're going to see you, we're going to look at your imaging, we're going to look at your problem, we're going to try to figure out what your goals are and what the right solution is for your individual problem. It may be XLIF, it may be something else, um, but you know, we, uh, we sort of pride ourselves that we're trained in multiple different uh, technologies, multiple different approaches, and really we'll try to tailor the solution to your particular problem. So we want to get you back to the game of life as fast as possible and as safely as possible. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Dr. Bill Walton. Before he comes up on stage, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about his career, if you don't know about it yet, and also talk to you about his back issues, which you don't know about. Bill Walton achieved star superstardom, playing for John Wooden's powerhouse in UCLA Bruins in the early 70s, winning three straight college Player of the Year awards, while leading the Bruins to two Division I national titles. He then went to become the first player drafted by the Portland Trail Blazers in 1974 NBA draft and quickly led them to a championship. He went on to play for the San Diego, now Los Angeles Clippers and Boston Celtics and is one of the only five NBA players to have led the league in block shots and rebounding in the same season. He was the league most valuable player, MVP, won two NBA championships, and in 1993, Bill Walton was befittingly inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. After retiring from basketball, he wasn't quite done yet. He began a 21-year broadcasting career, providing commentary to multiple sports media outlets, including CBS Sports, ABC, ESPN, Fox, and several others. For his work, he received an Emmy Award and the American Sportscasters Association named Mr. Walton as one of the top 50 sports broadcasters in 2009. Unfortunately, after zillions of years on the basketball court, like I said, no good deed goes unpunished, he had, actually I thought it was 36 different orthopedic um, procedures, but he told me it's 37, forced him to play most of his career with an increasingly injured back. Despite persistent back pain and leg pain, he carried on to become one of the most loaded NBA players of all time. After more than 30 years of pain, exhaustive non-operative treatment, he finally succumbed and had surgery, and he had a minimally invasive spine surgery. With his life restored now, today Mr. Walton serves as a patient ad ambassador and spokesperson for the Better Way Back a patient support and education program supported by Nuvasiv. He also serves on numerous boards and is an active, he's very active in business and civic organizations. He lives in his hometown in San Diego with his wife, Lori. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Walton.
I'm Bill Walton. I'm an XLIF patient. I'm an ambassador for the Better Way Back program, which all combined to make me the luckiest guy in the history of the world. It's wonderful to be back here in the basketball capital of the world. And to see what little Gino, <laughs> Brianna, Stephanie, and all the angels, to see what Kevin Ollie, Napier, Boatwright, and all the big ultimate winners of the genetic lottery were able to do <laughs> down in Dallas this year. I was there. <laughs> what a great story. What a great dream. And how perfect it is when dreams come true. But tonight is about what happens when the ball bounces the other way. And that's what's happened to, my guess, a lot of the people who are in this room tonight. Because that's what happened to me. I had it all. I was on top of the world. I had the greatest childhood ever. My parents, perfect. Although the most unathletic people you've ever seen in your I never shot a basket with my dad, not once. I saw my dad run at the church picnic one year. He, in a softball game, he drove that ball hard off the left field wall, and he was thrown out halfway to first base. <laughs> my mom was our town's librarian. My parents have no interest in sports as either a participant or a spectator. But they gave little Billy, with his then red hair, then hair at all, his big nose, his freckles, his goofy, nerdy-looking face, and his horrendous speech impediment. I'm a lifelong stutterer. I couldn't say a word until I was 28. Now that I've learned how to speak a little bit, it's my greatest accomplishment and your worst nightmare. <laughs> and I hope you got plenty of food on the way in and some water, and I hope you'd use the restroom. And now that I've learned how to speak a little bit, they make me bring a clock. I promised that I would look at it. At least I did at the beginning. I was touched in my life, as I have been here in my trip to Hartford, Connecticut, and the Yukon Health Center, because I grew up in a culture, in a world of people looking around and seeing a flawed universe. And people who said to themselves and each other, we can do better than this, and we're going to do something about it. And that's why I'm able to be here tonight. I was born with structural congenital defects in my feet that led to an endless string of stress fractures. I've had 37 orthopedic operations. My first one came when I was 14. I was down at the gym, and I was playing against some really old guys. They were in their 30s. <laughs> so they didn't like me torching them, so they took me down with a high, low, one, two. Tore up my knee, had to have my first operation. I dragged that bad leg around for 46 years before I finally had that knee replaced a year ago. But with the bad feet and with the bad knee that was eventually crooked with an incredibly severe valgus deformity, I had the bad foundation. Because in life, in muscular skeletal health, everything is about balance and symmetry. The ability to distribute the weight, the impact, the stress equally throughout the entire muscular skeletal system so that you have the balance and the symmetry to be able to support your spine. Everything in life comes back to your foundation. When the foundation is bad, ultimately everything up the line goes bad. When I was in college, 21 years old, playing for Johnny Wooden, there I was. Hadn't lost a game in five years. I was high above the basket making a play on the ball. 
the guy from the other team in a despicable act of violence and dirty play, he comes from the other side of the court, and he takes my legs out from underneath me, flips me over, and I land flat on my back on the innovation of the day, the tartan floor. I broke two bones in my spine that day, spent the next 11 days in the hospital, got up, put a corset on with steel rods in it, and flew across this great country of ours, Los Angeles to South Bend, Indiana, Notre Dame, the infidels, the thugs, the criminals. <laughs> we lost the 88 game winning streak that day. And we broke Coach Wooden's greatest admonition to us, which was always repeated every day from the coach. Do your best, your best is good enough, but whatever it is you do, don't beat yourself, don't cheat yourself, don't shortchange yourself, because that's the worst kind of defeat you'll ever suffer, and you'll never get over it. We had a 17-point halftime lead that day. With three minutes to go in the game, we had the ball and an 11-point lead in an era that predated the shot clock and predated the three-point shot. And we gave away a game to Digger Phelps, the devil himself. <laughs> and here's Digger. We missed our last six shots turned the ball over on four separate occasions. They made their last six shots, and they won the game by one at the buzzer, and now Digger Phelps wants to be president of our great country. <laughs> what has happened to our world? Kevin Ollie, Jim Calhoun, Gino, yes, I can see that. But Digger, no. So here I was. I was going along, and I lived with this back pain. I had the radiating nerve pain, I had the spasms, and some days it would be okay, and other days I couldn't do much. But I kept working on it, kept doing everything that I possibly could to give myself the chance. But ultimately, after 35, 37 plus years on the road, countless airplane rides in little tubes that I couldn't stand up in, little tiny seats, in hotels, not like the one I'm staying in in Framingham right now, Farmington, excuse me, but <laughs> hotels that I couldn't fit in the bed, or the bed was too low and too soft, and the bathroom ceilings way too low, couldn't stand up straight. All the furniture everywhere just built for preschool children. And, <laughs> and I finally got off the plane one day back in my hometown of San Diego, and I could no longer move. The pain was just too much, and it drove me to the ground. And here I was. I spent the next year, 18 months, however long it was, you lose all track of time, in unrelenting, debilitating, excruciating nerve pain. Nerve pain that just radiated throughout my entire body. The only way I can describe it is that I was submerged into a vat of scalding acid that had an electrifying current running through it, and I could never get out. My life was over. There was nothing worth living for. If I had a gun, I would have used it. I was going to jump off the bridge. Never discount the element of suicide in spine health. Spine health patients commit suicide at a greater rate than from any other calamity. Anybody who's ever been in this situation, they know exactly what I'm talking about, to where there's no hope. Anybody who has never had spine pain, they have no idea what it is that we go through. Think for a moment of what the pillars of happiness in life are. That's the whole goal. Remember when John Lennon was growing up, and it was John, he didn't have much growing up, just a single mom and everything, and his mom was very cool, working all the time, trying to make a better life for her little Johnny. And she kept telling him the whole time, Johnny, Johnny, the purpose, the goal, the mission in life is to be happy. So John figures this out. Yeah, okay, I'm going to be happy. So he goes to school, and the teacher, the first day, says, okay, your homework assignment tonight is to go home and write a, write a, a paragraph about the mission, the purpose, and the meaning of life. So John says, this is no problem. School, this is as easy as can be. So he goes home, he writes one sentence. The mission, purpose, and goal in life is to be happy. Comes in, turns it in. The teacher looks at him and says, Sorry, Mr. Lennon, you don't, you don't understand the assignment. John looks back at the teacher and says, you don't understand life. 
the pillar, the foundation pillar of, of happiness in life is to be healthy. And when you have your health, anything is possible. When you don't have it, you can't get anything done. Just think, here I was, 6'11", redhead, freckles, big nose, goofy, nerdy looking face, a horrendous speech impediment, can't talk at all, and I'm a deadhead, having been to now more than 845 Grateful Dead concerts. <laughs> but I was able to become, as Dr. Onyuke said, one of the 50 greatest broadcasters of all time. Because they looked at me when I first tried to get going in that field. They said, are you kidding, Walt? We're not putting you on TV. You're going to start getting up there and stuttering and spitting all over everybody. You're going to start talking about Jerry Garcia and Bob Dylan and Neil Young. And we just can't have that. But I finally worked my way in. And any time that you find yourself doubting and feeling that I can't do something, just tell yourself, if Bill Walton can become a broadcaster for ESPN, I can do that. But here I was. I get off this plane, 2008, 2007. It's a blur these last six or seven years. And it's just awful. And I'm on that ground. And I can't move. And I lose everything. I lose my dignity. I lose my self-respect. I'm going to kill myself. I lose my job. I lose my insurance. It's just absolutely awful. I'm telling my wife, my wife, this angelic angel of mercy, just beautiful. I don't know what, what she's doing with me, but I told her to get out. Lori, it's time for you to go. Get out while the getting is good. That's how awful this is. She stayed. No one ever makes it to the top of this mountain alone. Then one day, I'm lying there, and I had to eat all my meals on the ground. And I'm lying there, and all I can do is basically just have Lori slide the plate of food right in front of me, and I just kind of push it right into my mouth and try to get it down. And it was just so awful, just miserable, had nothing going for me. So while I'm lying there in my end of the house, our youngest son, Chris, he comes over for a visit, and he's got his new puppy dog with him. Now, this puppy dog is a... 600 pound bull mastiff. <laughs> His slobber alone will cure, the, will, will cure the California drought that we're going through right now. And so when I'm in the other end of the house and I hear Chris comes in the front door and I can hear him unleash the dog. And the dog starts running through the house and going crazy. He's having the time of his life knocking everything over. And then he comes around the corner where I'm lying there and he sees me. And he's just so happy, just slobber everywhere, and his tail is wagging, and the house is shaking. And then he sees the plate of food in front of me. And he comes over and he eats the whole thing in one bite, porcelain included. And then he gets up, shakes his jowls again, slobber all over everything. And he goes, turns, and walks out. And he belches and passes gas on his way out. And there was nothing that I could do. And I did everything to try to get back into the game of life. Back surgery, that was the last thing I ever wanted. I never heard one person have anything good to say about spine surgery. And the minute you walk into this world of spine health and you're starting to have trouble, people are gonna come up to you from all over, total strangers, don't do it, don't have back surgery. I knew somebody who said it, who had back surgery 45 years ago and they said it was, the worst thing that had ever happened in their lives. Well, is there anybody here who doesn't know what this is? Is there any, this was invented seven years ago. We think today that this has always been with us. And when we tell stories to our children about how we actually had to talk on a landline and we had to actually answer the phone that rang. It didn't vibrate. They're stunned. They say, oh, man, you guys, you guys were soft. You mean when you were growing up, you didn't have smartphones? You mean to tell me that when you were growing up, marijuana was illegal? You mean to tell me when you were growing up, same-sex marriage was not allowed? You guys were soft. You didn't do anything out there. Now, 
Is there anybody here who's still using a rotary phone? You are, okay. See me afterwards, okay? This was invented four years ago, and how much this has changed our lives. The revolution that we see here that Steve Jobs brought to us is the same revolution that Ann and Gus and Dr. Onyuke and Dr. Moss are driving right here at this incredible health center right here, UConn, the center of the basketball world. And just all these people who have come together with new technology, new techniques, new equipment, new procedures that have allowed people like me to get back into the game alive. I was so lucky. I was lying on that ground. I was going to kill myself. I had a friend. You know him. His name is Jim Gray, one of the Hall of Fame broadcasters that I've had the privilege of working with for the last 20 years of my life. I worked with Jim every weekend for 20 years. And one weekend, I, couldn't, I wasn't there. And Jim said, where's Bill? He's on the ground with his back. Jim called me every day. Jim called me every day and said, Bill, don't give up. You can make it. And Jim, he went out and he found my doctor. And he went out and he found Nuvasiv, the medical device company, which a dozen years ago was a dream, was a startup, was a vision. How can we help people who, whose lives are ruined? And not only their lives are ruined, but their spouse's lives. And everybody around them, their lives are ruined. And so they've completely changed our world. And I tried everything to avoid spine surgery. The last thing I wanted somebody cutting me open. Dr. Moss, I would love to be able to speak like him, just so fast, so fluid, so perfect. And here he is just, I mean, he's so much like Steve Nash, this little Canadian, you know, coming down, <laughs> giving so much to us. But years ago, the operation that they used to do on people like me, and maybe some of you as well, they called it the shark bite because the incision went from here all the way around to the back. And it looked as if you had just been eaten by a shark. Spine surgeons, they do four things. They take junk out. They decompress to allow the movement of the spinal cord. And then they straighten the spine. And finally, when needed, they stabilize it with all the hardware. And I had all four of those things done to me. But I didn't want anybody cutting me open. It's one thing when they start cutting on your feet. That was all to get back to playing basketball. But without any sort of positive reinforcement. And that's why I'm so passionately committed to the Better Way Back program. Think for a moment about the ultimate lesson in life as a student. And the mantra that applies here is you'll never learn what you don't want to know. And so here I was, scared to death about this spine surgery. So I did everything. All the different techniques, the massage, the yoga, the acupuncture, the drugs, the stretching, the core training, everything possible to develop that balance and symmetry but it wasn't working. And ultimately, I needed to have surgery. And so there I am. I'm lying in the hospital bed, getting ready. And they just put the drip in. And when you've already had 36 operations, you know what that drip means. And when the world starts to fog over. And so my spine surgeon, Steve Garfin, is standing there. He's like Dr. Moss, little tiny guy. And, but, a lot like John Wooden, a lot like Bob Dylan, and a lot like Steve Nash, a true giant. John Wooden always used to tell us, it's not how big you are, it's how big you play. It's not a game of size and strength. It's a game of skill, timing, and position. It's not how high you jump. It's where you are and when you jump. And so Wooden, who I was his worst nightmare. I mean, I, I, I was his easiest recruit, drove the guy crazy, and I drove him to an early grave at 99. 
But every time he would say these profound statements, which made no sense to me, I was a teenager. Are you kidding me? When I played for him, I was 17, 18, 19 years old. He was in his mid-60s at the time, and he keeps saying things. It's not a game of size and strength. And I'd say, wait a second. How can you say that with a straight face? You tell us it's not a game of size and strength. Come on. Kareem has all the records, Shaq has all the money, and Wilt has 20,000 girlfriends. So what is up with this size and strength stuff? And he would jump right back at me and say, Walton, you're the slowest learner I've ever had. Don't you understand it's not about stuff? It's not about material accumulation and physical gratification. No, it's about training the mind, what they do right here at UConn Health. That ability to visually see the future to have that dream, to have that plan, to take advantage of all that new technology that's out there. Because what's happening in the communications world, what's happening in science, is really being driven by what's happening in medicine. And no more so than in the toughest part of all, which is the spine. If you break your arm, it's one deal. You break your leg, come on. They put a cast on it, you get better. When you're in the world of spine health, you're in it for the rest of your life. I had no idea. You'll never learn what you don't want to know. And so when I'm lying there in this hospital bed, February 8th, 2009, five and a half years ago, tears streaming down my face, my life is over. I don't even know if I'm going to come out of this. And the doctor's standing there, he's patting me on the hand, saying, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. And I reached out to him just as I'm going under, and I squeezed him with what little strength I had left. Because I had been on the floor for so long, my total body just had just dilapidated. My biggest mistake, my biggest problem was that I waited too long. I didn't know. And so as I squeezed him and held on to him with everything that I had, I looked right into his eyes, and I said, please, doctor, please, Dr. Garfin, please fix me. Please give me another chance. Please let me climb on the mountain one more time. Please let me play in the game of life one more day. Please let me ride my bike again one more time. And then bam, I'm just out, right? And I wake up and it was worse. I felt like I'd been run over by an 18-wheeler out here on Interstate 84 there on the way to Bristol. And then, and after the guy ran over me the first time, he went down the block, turned around and came back and did it again. And then when he left, then he sent the steamroller in. They just put all that new pavement right through downtown Hartford on. That steamroller came and flattened me. And that was me. And oh, it was tough. Everybody is different. If I had done it sooner, it wouldn't have been as hard. That was my mistake. Because I was unwilling to listen. I was unwilling to learn as to what the possibilities are out there for all of us to get back to that foundational pillar of happiness, which is health. I've had now three fusions. Both my ankles are fused, my spine is fused, and I've got a new knee. I waited too long on all of them. I have wasted so much of my life sitting around thinking I'm going to get better. But that's the mindset that I've always had, that sense of, I can do this, I can get this done. I can be tough, I can grind it out. It's just a matter of, of working more, working smarter, working longer, working harder. That's not the way spine health works. Because when they were inside of me, they did it all. Took all the junk out, decompressed, straightened everything up, put all the screws and bolts and nuts. Now my surgery, which was five and a half years ago, took eight and a half hours. In those last five and a half years, the time, the improvement, it just keeps getting better and better. Now they're doing these things in just less than two hours. And in the big picture of things, my problems were minuscule. Because when you're at the point that I was, you're going to be in that doctor's office and you're going to be looking around, you're going to be seeing all the people with their cages and their halos, you're going to be seeing people in the wheelchairs and all bent over and they can't even move and everybody's crying, it's so sad. In the big picture, mine was nothing but it was mine, and that made it the worst injury in the world. And the ones you're facing right now, they're yours, which make them the worst in the world. So accept the fact that you've got to do something. 
You are not going to get better in the world of spine health by sitting on the couch watching ESPN and drinking tequila all day. <laughs> this is something you have to be able to work through, to be able to exercise to develop the strength, the balance, the coordination, and the balance and the symmetry in your whole muscular skeletal system so that you can have that chance. This has not been an easy journey for me. The 36 operations that I had on my feet and my knees and my hands and my face, those were a piece of cake all together, all 36 of them, a piece of cake compared to what I had with my spine here. And so I, I come out and I start to get better, although it's so tough and so long. And, I've, and I'd really basically given up. I had been fired from my job. It was just so hard and so difficult. And it wasn't happening at all, but I still kept listening to what the doctors say. And it's critical that you choose a doctor that you like, that you respect, and that you trust. Because your life is in his hands. And he's got this situation where he's got to tell you what you need to do. And he does this every single day. We're going to do it, hopefully, only one time in our lives. And while we think we know everything, I can remember the day I graduated from UCLA and Coach Wooden wrote one of his maxims to me, to Bill Walton, it's the things you learn after you know it all that count. <laughs> and so my, my spine doctor wrote a very similar one to me. And Sunday morning, I'm speaking to the graduate school uh, on their graduation of the medical school at UC San Diego. So I'm truly the luckiest guy on earth. But during this long and arduous recovery program, you lose faith. You no longer believe. And that was me. But I was super lucky in that my family and my friends, my teammates, and my wife and our children, they would call every day and they'd say, Bill, don't give up. Don't give up, Bill. You can make it. So here I was. I kept going down to the pool. Because at the end of the line, when you're old and in the way like I am, and you have the limitations in life where you can't do the things that you normally dream of doing, that's just natural. We all end up in three places for exercise and sport. The swimming pool, the weight room, and the bicycle. Because those are three things that we can do, allow us to move, allow us to exercise, allow us to stretch it all out, and not beat our bodies up. I could no longer ride my bike, but I could go to the pool, and I go every day. There's a pool, 90 degree indoor pool, YMCA, 10 minutes door to door from my house. My feet hit the floor in the morning, and I'm at that pool every single day. I don't swim, I don't put my head underneath the water, I just move. I just work it all out, stretch, get all the kinks out, and then come home after a hot shower and get in that weight room and just start working on the core from the chest to the knees. Because the life that we live, sadly, puts us into the flexed position. And that's the worst thing in the world because you have to get to that position in life of extension with the head up and the shoulders back. And until this position here becomes totally natural to you, you have no chance of long-term spine health. So here I was. I had given up. It was just too hard. And then one day, seven months, seven months to the day after my operation, I'm in the weight room. I'd already been to the pool, and I'm pushing that steel. I'm not doing anything hard. I don't lift like that. I just lift for exercise, a little bit of resistance, the pushing and the pulling and the knee extensions and all the different things. And it turned. And I could feel that for the first time, I had a future. And it was just the greatest moment, this epiphonic moment in my life that I'll never forget. I had on the stereo, I had Jerry Garcia singing Bob Dylan's most beautiful song ever, The Visions of Johanna. The vision that tomorrow is going to be better and there's something ahead worth looking for. And so there I was in the weight room, Jerry singing Bob. Ain't it just like the night to play tricks when we're trying to be so quiet? We sit here stranded but we're all doing our best to deny it. And as today we mourn the passing of Maya Angelou and the great poets, the dreamers, the visionaries, the guys who were willing to step to the front and say, I'll take care of this. 
Dr. Onyuke, Dr. Moss, Gus, and all the people here at UConn Health who are doing everything they can to give you the chance to get back there in the game of life. It turned for me, and I had the chance. So I closed down the weight room. I went back across the yard, and I gave my wife the biggest hug and the biggest kiss. And the tears of sadness, which had been there for years, now turned to tears of happiness. With my spine, I cried every day. Every day it was so tough, so hard, and there was just no hope. The desperation, loss of control, and everything spiraling miserably out of control. But now I could feel it, and there was something to look forward to. And I told Lori, I'm going to make it. I can feel it. It turned today from deep inside. And it was just absolutely incredible how great that feeling was that day, Labor Day weekend. Now, two days later, I went out on my bike for the first time in a seemingly forever. I love my bike. My bike is everything to me. It's the most valuable thing that I have. My bike is my gym, my church, and my wheelchair all in one. Because my bike embodies everything that I believe in. Science, technology, metals, components, discipline, structure, a plan, sacrifice, a vision. But what my bike really means to me is freedom and independence, the ability to get from here to there, because I can't walk. I can get a little bit around, but because of my feet, because of my knees, because of my spine, I, don't, I can't walk for exercise. The problem that I have with all my orthopedic challenges is that what's good for my spine, which is walking and moving, is bad for my legs. What's good for my legs is bad for my spine, so every day is a constant battle. How I find that balance, and my bike allows me to do this. But I hadn't been able to ride for seemingly forever. And I go out there this very first day, just two days after this epiphonic moment with Jerry and Bob and my wife, Lori. And I was all bent over still. I couldn't stand up. I could barely turn the cranks. But I was on my bike. And I could feel the wind. And I could feel the sun. And I could feel that thin film of sweat. And it was just so perfect. I'm riding my bike again. Yeah, I was just going right around the neighborhood, level, flat perfect pavement, and if you can find perfect pavement in San Diego, please call me up. <laughs> and I'm coming around just a few minutes out there on my bike, and I'm coming around the last turn. We've lived in the same house now for 35 years. And as I come around to slow down and dismount and go back inside and tell Lori how fantastic it is that I was on my bike today, oh my gosh, how far I've come. All the teenagers, they're sitting on this far street corner, and they're just happy as can be, it's summertime, it's just perfect, and they see me, Bill, you're riding your bike, this is great, what wonderful news, your back must be feeling better, I'm saying, yeah, I'm going to make it, I'm feeling better and better, I'm saying, that's great, Bill, terrific, and then the 14-year-old boy, the guy that lives next door, he's got a couple of real hot California beach girls with him, right, they're all decked out in their bikinis and everything, and oh my gosh, He's going to show off for these young, hot California beach girls. So as I'm slowing down to dismount and waving to all the teenagers, he jumps up and he grabs his Tony Hawk skateboard, and he comes out into the street to put on a show and draw all the attention to himself. And he loses control on takeoff, and he plows right into me. And he knocks me over. And I go falling down in a broken, pitiful, bleeding, bloody, helpless, hopeless ball of flesh, and all the teenagers, they just run, just disappear, dust in the wind. I look back, my bicycle is broken, I feel here where I landed, my pelvis is broken, I feel back here, my sacrum is broken, but my spinal fusion held. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Moss, thank you, Dr. Onyuke, thank you, Nuvasive, thank you, Sean, thank you, Cookie, thank you, Matt, thank you, Gus, thank you, Anne. But I was back on the ground for four more months. And I'm just crying. And I'm on the phone with the doctor. And I'm just saying, I can't do this. This is too hard. It's just too difficult. I can't. I, I give up. And he said, Bill, think back. Because doctors, they do more than just the surgeries. They heal in unknown ways. And so my doctor, who knew about Coach Wooden, knew about my relationship with Coach Wooden, he said, Bill, think back. 
to what John Wooden gave you in terms of that foundation, that pyramid of success and all those human values and personal characteristics that will enable you when times are tough to be able to come back to your core, to be able to start over, regroup, and charge out there one more time. And what were those, Bill? Industriousness, enthusiasm, friendship, loyalty, cooperation, intentness, initiative, alertness, self-control, physical fitness, skill development, commitment to the team, poise, confidence, and competitive greatness. I said, yeah, I remember all those, but what does that have to do with the fact that my back is killing me? And he looked at me and he said, Bill, years later, after John Wooden, who spent 14 years working on that pyramid of success, he added two external words at the top. And those are the ones that I want you to focus on now. And those two words, Bill, are faith and patience. Do you believe? And are you willing to put the lifetime in that it takes to get this job done? Now, as we make a transition to what it means for you guys in the space that you're in right now, think of and the great thing about basketball, which is the world's most perfect game. I mean, in basketball, all you have to do is wait for the opening tip, and then it's who's in shape, who's got a game, and who can play, and who really wants this. Guys like Boatwright, my little favorite Boatwright, running around out there, right? And that little trick half step toodaloo move he did on that big guy from Kentucky and just left his jockstrap hanging there on the floor. <laughs> but basketball, perfect. Where on every play, you can make a positive contribution to your team's effort to win. Unlike football, which is basically a halfway house between the army and prison. And <laughs> baseball, which is a bunch of out of shape guys standing around, scratching themselves, taking steroids, and waiting for the game of life to come to them. So Coach Wooden, his pregame speech was the same. And it's a message that you have to absorb, believe, trust, and then implement in your life. Because he would come into our locker room, and we're all ready to go. We're just fired up as can be. We're waiting for him to give us the big speech, give us the keys to victory, tell us what it's going to take to be great. And he'd walk in there and he'd look at us with his little rolled up program. He never opened up this program. I mean, it could have been the, the menu up at the cafeteria upstairs. He pointed at us with that program and he said, men, I've done my job. The rest is up to you. When that game starts, don't ever look over here at the sideline to me because I can't do anything more to help you. And that's the same message that Dr. Moss, Dr. Onyuke, and Ann and Gus and all the great surgeons and doctors here, they can only do what they do. If we don't do what we have to do, improve our diet, improve our lifestyle, stop smoking, get rid of all the stuff that's going to tear our body down and start building ourselves up, if we don't do the exercise, if we just think we're going to get better by sitting there and waiting for this pain to go away, we're never going to get better. And now let's make the transition again. Because in basketball, all the words that are the lexicon of basketball are perfect for what we're all going through as our spines are just killing us and we're having that leg pain and the nerve pain just burning through our body. And will somebody please stop this? And nothing works. I had the privilege recently of interviewing Michael Jordan. Anybody here who doesn't know who Michael Jordan is? Anyway, Michael's the personification of excellence in all things on and off the court, with the exception of the Charlotte Bobcats, and he promised me in this interview that he's working on that too. So I asked Michael, I said, Michael, you are known for proving that Copernicus, Galileo, Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein were wrong, in that physics and gravity do not exist. But Michael, here you are as being average size. I mean, in the basketball world, Michael Jordan is basically Dr. Moss's size. And here's Michael, who's not the biggest, who's not the strongest, who's not the fastest, who can't jump the highest. But Michael, every single game, would come out there and look at the ultimate winners of the genetic lottery. Shaq, Ewing, Olajuwon, 
David Robinson, Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan, and he'd come down that lane, he'd be throwing it down in their face, saying, there's nothing you can do about that, and he was right. So I asked Michael, Michael, how much time did you spend working on all those incredibly spectacular plays that ESPN keeps looping on a constant basis? And he looked at me with incredulity, and he said without hesitation, Bill, I didn't spend a second on any of that stuff. I spent all my time on the fundamentals, on my foundation, on physical fitness, on balance, on symmetry, on skill development, on my footwork, on my commitment to the team. But what I really spent my time doing, Bill, was thinking and dreaming about what it was going to take for me to come out on top. And that is your challenge to identify with written checklists what can I do to get better in my life? What physical steps on a daily basis? My wife, God bless her soul, she would leave these post-up notes for me around the house when I'm, getting, when I'm coming back. Bill, today you were able to turn over in bed by yourself. Bill, today you were able to put on your own t-shirt. Bill, today you were able to take one less pain medication dosage. Bill, today you went from a wheelchair to a walker. Bill, today, and this was the greatest, she left the biggest smile on this note, was Bill, today you were able to put your own shoes and socks on. And what a day that was for me. Bill, today you were able to bend down and pet the dog. Because Christopher, with that big dog, Cortez, who ate my food that day, that dog is now our dog. And he's my service dog. And he's the greatest dog in the history of the world. And he's got the biggest smile. And what my service dog does for me is he makes me happy. But there's no way I could ever be happy in life if I had that pain, which these guys and their compatriots took away. And so I spend all my time with the Better Way Back program every day, face to face, on the internet, on the telephone talking people into putting the gun down, talking people into don't jump off the bridge. There's a chance. There's a hope. And think of what it was like for me so many years ago when it was my feet that were giving me the trouble. And I'm sitting there and nobody can figure out what's wrong. And they can't give me any hope, any direction whatsoever. So they had this big conference. And I was the MVP of the NBA. We were the champions. We had this great, great team. And nobody knew what to do with my feet. And so they had this big convocation of business guys, bankers, television executives, lawyers, insurance agents, and doctors. And they all come together at this hotel at LAX in Los Angeles. And we're sitting there all day long. People are talking, what are we going to do? How is it going to play out for Walton here? None of the news was any good. So finally, at the end of the day, they needed to have some sort of resolution. And so the guy who was moderating the program said, OK, if you're not a doctor, get to the back of the room. I only want the doctors to the front. And there was 10 or 12 of them there. And I'd seen all of them individually, but here they all were together for the first time. My x-rays were all over the wall. My medical records, everybody had been going over there. I was looking at my feet, pulling, tugging, twisting. And so the guy who's moderating, he goes around the room. First guy, he'll never play again. Second guy. He'll be in constant and worsening pain the rest of his life. He'll walk with a miserable limp the rest of his life. That bone in his foot is going to die. We're going to have to cut his foot off pretty soon. I'm 28 years old. Oh, my God. And they get to the last guy, the oldest guy in the room. And he's been quiet all day. I had been seeing him a lot, just one-on-one. -on -one. And he looked up at everybody else, and he says, I've got an idea. They said, what? What is it, Dr. Wagner? One of Dr. Wagner's associates, his dad is here in the audience tonight. And it was so great to be able to see him one more time. So Dr. Wagner, he looks around the room, he says, I got an idea. What is it? I've come up with a new surgery. What is it? He, ex he describes this incredibly complex five huge massive cuts all around and over the top of the foot taking everything out, putting everything back in, sawing, cutting, sewing. Unbelievable. And the, and the doctors are just sitting there just slack-jawed, right? They just can't believe what this doctor is explaining to them. And they all looked at him and they said, that'll never work. And he just stood fast and looked right back at him. 
And they said, Dr. Wagner, how many of these have you done? I said, I've done 10 of them. How many have worked? None. And I said, I'm going with him because he's given me a chance. And what do we have to lose? We can't just sit there in our pain and our misery. We got to take action. And so while I spent all this time with the Better Way Back program, and that's an advocacy program that helps people like you on both ends. I know we have Sandy, I know we have Lou here who are on the back side of the surgical procedure here. They're going to come up and speak in a little bit. But I also do another thing. Because while this program is about education, illumination, advocation, it's also about celebration. It's about the fact that I got my life back. I have no pain. I take no medication. I had no idea what life was like without back pain. It's a miracle what's happened to me. So I go out and I celebrate that miracle. Yes, I have a duty, obligation, responsibility to give back to the people who have given me this life, and that's why I'm here. But I also go out and I help the people who are on the back end, who are already out there celebrating. So one of the things that we do, that I volunteer for a group, we buy wheelchairs and prosthetics for people that don't have arms and legs so that they can participate in the game of life through sport. And generally, the people who we support are Afghan and Iraqi veterans coming back blown up, think their life is over. Young children who had the serious birth defects, never had a chance, the chance that we all take for granted. Or somebody who's been in a horrific accident, motorcycle accident, industrial accident. They get hurt really bad. Their life is just ruined. They think it's over. We know better from our own personal experience. So we go out and we provide programs, leadership, friendship, mentoring, and we raise money. We raise money to buy the sports chairs and the prosthetics so that they can get going themselves. And so one of the things that we do is we ride our bikes every year from San Francisco to San Diego. 750 miles the way I go. Everybody else takes them 650, but always lost is one of my nicknames in the world of cycling. <laughs> well deserved it, but that assumes that I know where I'm going. And so the first year I do this, I just had my spine surgery. And I'm coming down the very last day. And we're in Del Mar, Del Mar, California, just north of San Diego. Believe me, if the pilgrims had landed in Del Mar, Connecticut would still be wilderness. <laughs> it's really nice there. And here it was. Today it was like winter in Del Mar. And so we're in a big group. There's 125 of us that ride every year. We raise millions of dollars to buy all these expensive sports equipment. We get to Del Mar, and there's one last hill in front of us, the Torrey Pines Hill, right where the golf course is. And I'm feeling great. I had no idea what it was going to be like on the way down. But now I'm within 15 miles of the end, including one big, long hill. So I pull away from the group, and I slow down, and I back off the pace. And I'm just telling myself, I cannot believe how lucky I am. Are you kidding me? It wasn't that long ago that I was lying on the floor going to kill myself. And everybody calling me and saying, don't give up, Bill. You can make it. And now I just rode my bike 750 miles from San Francisco to San Diego down the coast of California. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. This is fantastic. And now I'm on that long, hard climb. And in the world of cycling, as in the world of life, you live for that long, hard climb. That's the fun part. That's where it all comes together. The part that so many of us are in right now, so many of you, when you're wallowing around in the muck at the bottom and you have no idea where to go. You have no plan, you have no hope, you have no dream for the future. But now, I'm actually celebrating. I'm riding my bike, and I'm on the climb, and I'm going. I'm all by myself, and it's sunny, and it's beautiful, and sweat just pouring off. I got the biggest grin on my face, and I'm thinking all these people just telling me, don't give up, Bill, you can make it. And I come around the halfway mark, and I figure everybody's already gone and passed. But I look up ahead of me, and just up the way is one of my teammates. Her name is Kelly, and Kelly is the finest looking woman in the world. She's just like gorgeous, perfect, like Michelangelo, like Da Vinci, like Juanita over here is Dr. Moss's wife, and just absolutely perfect. <laughs> just want to reach out there and touch him, you know. It's like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. And Kelly, unlike us, Kelly's in a wheelchair, and she's paralyzed from the ribs down. And she had just ridden her hand cycle all by herself from San Francisco to San Diego. And she's on that last long, hard climb. Now, in the world of challenges, what we do is we 
do what we can. We figure it out, and we get the job done. And that epitomizes what this group down here, these doctors, these healthcare providers and practitioners are giving us. They're figuring out and they're getting it done, changing all the time, going from the rotary phone to the smartphone, going from the Dewey Decimal System to an iPad, going from the shark bite to minimally invasive surgery, giving us the chance to play in the game. And so I'm coming up behind Kelly, and Kelly's really struggling. And she's not going to make it. I'm singing the songs of our organization, Jerry Garcia, The Mission in the Rain. Some folks would be so happy to have just one dream come true. Or maybe Bob Dylan, The Chimes of Freedom. Far between, sundown's finish and midnight's broken toll. We ducked inside the doorway, thunder crashing, tolling for the warrior, tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsake, tolling for the outcast, burning constantly at stake, striking for the gentle, striking for the kind, striking for the guardians and protectors of the mind. And for every uptight, hung up person in this whole wide universe, we gaze upon those chimes of freedom flashing. And so I'm singing these songs to Kelly as I'm coming up behind her, and I'm telling her, don't give up, Kelly, don't give up. I see that she's crying, and she's not going to make it. Now I'm right next to her. And we're barely moving. And if she doesn't get one more crank over, she's going to start coasting backwards down this hill again, and then she's really going to be up against it. I look down. She's already in her climbing gear. She's got nothing left mechanically. But she finds something deep inside, and we get the rhythm going. And she turns it over once. And once you learn that you can do it once, okay, I can do this again. And I can do this again. And what is that fourth law of learning from John Wooden after demonstration, imitation, correction, repetition? The daily work that you and I have to do for the rest of our lives to get that balance and that symmetry. When Kelly and I crested the top of the mountain, we just soared like eagles right down into La Jolla Cove there. And there was a thousand little children all of them with prosthetics, all of them in wheelchairs, just so happy that we were able to do something to help them. As I come to the end of my introductory remarks, <laughs> I, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. I want to I wanna provide you with my home phone number. I, I, I only have one phone. I don't have a home. I live in the airport. In, 619-890-9085. That's 619-890-9085. Call me any time, day or night, and let me know how I can help you. I have one email, bill.walton at billwalton.com, bill.walton at billwalton.com. And we are here for you, because I know of the people who have been here for me, and now it's my turn. And I'm lucky and privileged and honored that I can do it. I just want to leave you before we bring up Sandy and Lou, and they can tell their stories. And we'll bring up the doctor, too, and they can answer any questions. I want to leave you with what it was like when I'm lying on that floor. And you're going through the stages in life that I went through, that everybody eventually goes through, where you think you're going to die, to where you want to die, to the worst of all possible stages, which is, oh my gosh, I'm going to live, and this is what I'm stuck with forever. So I'm lying there, and I just kept listening to the music, just kept li listening to the leaders. And in celebration and honor of Maya Angelou today, I'll start with one of her quotes when she said that people will never remember what you say. They'll never remember what you do but they will always remember how you treat them. And I know that I have been treated spectacularly by the people here at UConn Health. I know that I have been treated spectacularly by the people here in New England. The Celtics, Red Auerbach, Larry Bird, and all you people, when I was coming back and wanted that chance one more time, you didn't give me my career back. You gave me my life back because you gave me a reason to believe. That happened again when I fell into the world of spine health and the nightmare that it is. And so the other ones that I'll leave you with, Neil Young from the Fork in the Road album, Light a Candle. Instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle for where we're going. There's something ahead worth looking for. Bob Dylan, 
He who's not busy being born is busy dying. Martin Luther King, we may have all come here in different boats, but we're all in the same boat now. Mahatma Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in the world. Jerry Garcia, does any of this really matter anyway? I'm here to tell you that it does. I'm living proof. Bob Dylan, The Simple Twist of Fate, I hear the ticking of the clock. How, much, how long must I wait for that simple twist of fate? People tell me it's a sin to know and feel too much within. Blame it on a simple twist of fate. Neil Young, what if you knew her and saw her there on the ground? How can you run when you know? Neil Young, I'm going to walk like a giant on the land. I don't want to float like a leaf in the stream. And finally, Bob Dylan. We'll close it out. We'll bring up Sandy and Lou. Bob Dylan, when I paint my masterpiece, the streets of Rome are filled with rubble. Ancient footprints are everywhere. You'd almost think that we're seeing double on this beautiful spring day at Yukon Health. Those mighty kings of the jungle, I can hardly stand to see them. It sure has been a long, hard climb. I'm Bill Walton. I'm an ex-lift patient. I'm an ambassador for The Better Way Back, and I am indeed the luckiest guy on earth. Thanks so much for having me, folks. <laughs> Okay, can we get Sandy and Lou up here, please? Thank you, folks. Can we get Sandy and Lou up here? Where's Sandy? Dr. Moss? Just Sandy? Okay. Here comes Sandy. Come on, I'll give you a hand up the steps over here, Sandy. Sandy, how long ago was your surgery? You can use this microphone right here. Almost a year. July, Almost a year. July will be a wow, year. Wow, you're really fast yes, getting better there. I really have done well. How long had you suffered with back pain and uh, leg pain? Several years, and my, definitely my quality of life had, uh, had been affected, and uh, I decided that uh, I tried all the conservative uh, uh, treatments. I'd done physical therapy. I tried the steroid injection. That helped for a while. But I finally decided that while I was healthy and in good shape, that it was the time to have surgery. And Dr. Moss Dr. did your Moss surgery. Did my surgery, yes. And you still love him. I do. I absolutely do. But there had to have been times when you didn't believe. No, I, 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 it actually was not that bad. It's surgery. It hurts. But there's lots of medications out there that help you get through it. And uh, you just kind of take one day at a time and do everything you're supposed to do, and it works. So what are you able to do now? I'm back to walking. Uh, we, my husband and I were recently in London, and I was walking up to eight miles a day. Oh, Not my all gosh. at one time, but I was doing up to eight miles Congratulations. a day. Congratulations. And I'm very happy. How's your pain level now, Sandy? Oh, my pain is good. good. I have no pain. What about medication? No medication. And you can sleep at night? I do. And I you do can sleep. eat? I do. And you can think? I can. And you can dream? I do. And you can kiss your husband? I do. And he can wash your feet? <laughs> no, he doesn't do that. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Oh, my God. So there are limitations. Absolutely. What did I say up here today that you do not agree with and, and you think that I'm just crazy? No, I just, I, I mean, I just feel terrible that you had to uh, suffer so much before you so do I. relief. But I was stupid. You know, and I know I look stupid and I am stupid. But uh, I, I, I waited too long, and that's my big regret. And I think that I think you can do that. I think while you're healthy is the time to do it because the recovery is not easy. You do have to work. You do need some help uh, in those first initial weeks. You need help to you know shower and do all those kind of things. So. And um, what kind of 
program are you on right now in terms of health maintenance and improving your constant day-to-day -day living through exercise and movement? Do, uh, doing core exercises. My husband nags me every morning. Now, we're both recently retired, so this is, uh, you know, it's good to have, uh, have my quality of life back at this time when we can both enjoy life a little bit. You know, Coach Wooden, he had a saying for that, too, discipline yourself so that others won't have to. I know. That's <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Dr. Moss, do you have any comments? Thank you very much, Sandy, for coming. Thank you, Bill. It's quite a story, and um, really, I think if I can highlight one thing, is that whole idea that you know you talked. I, I hear this every day, that um, you know you, you had how many people came up to you and said, "This is the worst thing. Don't let anyone touch your back." And I, I really I hear that all the time, and um, you know, and it's sort of just you know, it's oh, who told you that? Was it your doctor? No, it was a friend of a friend of a friend who said someone had surgery and they never walked again. <laughs> You know, unfortunately, bad things can happen with surgery. It's not all uh, sunshine and rainbows, as we say. But um, certainly, we do have solutions for people out there. And uh, I think getting over that initial fear, and, and this is one of the wonderful things about Better Way Back, is you can talk to people who had surgery. Call somebody up. Call up Bill. We all have his number now. Call, Call him. Up. Email him. Talk Celtic basketball. Talk about who Danny's going to draft. <laughs> and, uh, and find out that maybe there is hope and there's a way for you to get better. And just, I think that getting over that fear that people have is really the number one thing and just making that leap to actually looking for something out there that can help you. Education is the key to success in any challenge that we face. The more that we know, the better our choices is going, are going to be. And I can remember when John Wooden was recruiting me and it was a wild and crazy time. I was 15 years old. It was the summer of love in California. And I'd already been to my first Grateful Dead concert. I'm like having the time of my life as a teenager. And all these coaches are coming from around the land. and They're making every promise to me in the world. They're saying, yeah, Bill, come to our school. We'll make you the most famous player in the history of our program. You'll set all the records. Mr. Walton, how about a new job for you? Mrs. Walton, how about a shopping spree? How about some new jewelry? Billy, here's the cheerleader's phone number. She's our closer out there. I mean, let your imagination run wild. And I used to think that I had a vivid imagination, but that was before I met Dennis Rodman and Marv Albert. And they changed the entire <laughs> spectrum of what was going on out there. And then John Wooden comes into my life, and he sits down in the family living room, where my mom still lives to this very day, 61 years in the same home, the same home they moved to when I was born. And Coach Wooden sits down there, and he says, Billy and Mr. and Mrs. Walton, I know what the other people are promising you. I know what they're telling you, but that's not the way life works. There's no guarantees out there. What I can promise you is that I'm going to give you a chance. And that's what UConn Health does. They give you the chance. But unless you're willing to invest, unless you think it's worthwhile, unless you want your life back, this is not something that they're just going to give you. It's not something that, it's, it's not a pill. It's not a key that they turn. It's an opportunity. They can fix you. They can give you that opportunity to get back in the game and to climb on that mountain to ride your bike one more time. But unless you do the work, it's not going to happen. What else? Any other questions out there? We got some questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am. The loser. Oh, that 14-year-old boy lives next door. No, no, no. The one in the basketball court. Oh, he's in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Life without parole. <laughs> the little 14-year-old boy, his parents divorced and they moved away. I never saw him again. It was just terrible. Oh, God. It was bad. It was very bad. But that fucking criminal, oh, boy, in college, he, he got what he did. He was in jail. Yeah. With Questions. Yeah. Mike. Yes. Yes. A, a question of the number of patients that come to you, Doctor. Doctor Martin. Yeah. A, of the number of patients that come to you and you uh, do the diagnosis and the studies and you determine that they do require surgery. Mm -hmm. What percentage would you anticipate would make the same recovery as this uh, the person today? Well, Sandy is exceptional uh, in her motivation and uh, in the commitment to get better. And uh, that really is half the battle. So we give her uh, that credit. You know, I always say my, hard, my job takes about three, four, five, six hours, and your job takes about six months to get better. So um, it's a tough question to answer. You know, my sort of rule of thumb personally is if I can't look you in the eye and tell you that there's a probably 80, 85 percent chance you're going to get better from my operation, I'd tell you to go away. And I get people all the time, I say, you know, eh, it's probably 50-50.
And I said, I, you know, I don't think you should have the operation because, again, you know, we're hearing great stories here, but bad things can happen. And uh, if I tell them it's 50-50, I say, go, go, you know, you should probably try something else. And they'll say, hey, doc, I'll take that chance. And I always say, I won't. You know, and I think that's um, a lot of the stories you hear out there is probably our fault. Maybe, maybe people, uh, you know, too much surgery is not the right thing to do. So, again, my rule of thumb is trying to be 80, 85 percent that we're going to make you better. Think for a moment, sir, about the responsibility that Ann and Gus, who uh, Gus spoke early, who started the program, and then Ann, who is the COO here at UConn Health. Yeah. Yeah. Their responsibility, along with Dean Torty, is to build the team. And they have gone out and they have found the best of the best. The way that Jim Calhoun, the way that Red Auerbeck, the way that John Wooden, they put these teams together. The way that Pat Riley down with the Miami Heat right now. They get the best. And then they come and they get these guys who are willing to commit and willing to give up their lives. Dr. Moss, he's got four angelic children at home with Juanita under the age of eight. Dr. Onyuke, he's got five children at home. And it's un unbelievable how these guys, they have no lives. They're just constantly working with psychopaths like me who are just, you know, ready to kill themselves. And then as soon as I get better, there's somebody else coming through that door. And so your job is to make the decision. Okay, where am I going to go? You've got lots of choices out there. And that's why we're here to provide the educational background and foundation so that you guys can have the knowledge to make an educated choice. Because when you walk in, when you get to... When you get to a good doctor, the last thing they want to do is operate because they know that there's no turning back from that point. And if you can get better, please do whatever it takes to get better without an operation. But sometimes you just have to have that operation. And I was one of those guys. I had to have, I was not going to get better. And that's when I knew it was time for me. And am I sure glad that I did? And I'm just kicking myself ever since that I waited too long. Did that answer your question, sir? What was your question, by the way? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Bill, we have Lou who wants to come, come on up, up here, Lou. Come well. on. So, Lou, how long ago was your surgery? Which one? <laughs> how many have you had? Two. Two. How long ago was your first one? Uh, 2008. So, six years ago. And what did they do there? Uh, fused three vertebrae. A, a three-level fusion. But they did a, uh, what you, I guess we call it, conventional method? Open. An open, a shark bite. You yeah. got a big scab, a big scar there, yeah. right? Okay. And then when was your most, and, and how did that turn out? Well, uh, prior to that there, I was told I waited too long, like everybody else. Right. And uh, back, some, back of my legs were hurting all the time. And you couldn't and I, walk? You no, know, not couldn't at all. Couldn't move, couldn't sleep, couldn't, couldn't think? Couldn't sleep in a bed. I slept five months in a recliner. Yep. And uh, I uh, blamed it all on overweight, out of shape. You know no, 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 believe me. I never would have thought that. Well, okay. And so then what happened? Uh, I finally went to the doctor and they told me I came here. The doctor's no longer here now. And uh, he did the surgery and it was heaven to me because I could sleep in a bed, I could walk. How long uh, ago was that, Lou? That was 2008. And then a couple of years later, it just didn't seem right. Something wasn't right. So he says, I'll go back to him, see what he finds. He was gone. And it was Dr. Moss. And I didn't know him from Adam, and what am I going to do? So I read up on him on the uh, net, and uh, well, he seemed like he knows what he's doing, so I'll go see him. <laughs> Turned out to be a great guy. And an excellent basketball player, high school champion up in Montreal. Yes. <laughs> and married the most beautiful girl in the school? They, they grow him short up there. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Nash was a post player up in Canada. <laughs> so you had your surgery with Dr. Moss? Yes, I did in 2011. Okay, and how's that doing now? Fantastic. Okay, wait, what did he do there? You, because he you already had a three level fusion. Then he did another one. Another level? Yeah. Oh, so I got. Yeah, I got what, eight screws, four Good. rods, two clamps. And, and how's the pain level now? No pain. No pain. What about the medication level? No medication. No medication. Eat, sleep, do whatever you want? Well, I'm still a little overweight. Yeah. <laughs> that thought never would have crossed my mind. Well, <laughs> that's why I mentioned it. How's your checklist doing of things it, that you could do to improve your spine health and your uh, balance and your symmetry? Bicycle riding is, uh, I also, my wife and I bicycle ride a lot. And, uh, Isn't that I, fun? Oh, I love it. It just feels so good with the sun and the wind and the sweat. But it's, around here, we, uh, 
throw them on the back of the car, and we went up to Block Island, went around all down Block Island. Oh, really great. Nice. Good time. How old are you, Lou? 60, uh, 71. 71? Yeah. Gosh. You look 25 years younger than I do, and I'm 61. You should see my wife. Oh. <laughs> She's like your sweetheart. She's the only thing that got me through. Mine, too. There's no oh, way okay. I could have done it without my wife. I never went for uh, rehabilitation or anything like that, and she put me through everything. And she's only crazy this big. So what's your routine now? What do you do now to maintain the level of comfort and satisfaction that you have? Uh, eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Was that on doctor's orders, too? Yeah, no, just the opposite. <laughs> no, I, we ride bikes. We ride a bicycle just about every day. A couple, three miles, no big deal. But, yeah, but you're moving. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're yeah. moving. We're very active. We go to Florida for three months. Fantastic. Yeah. What of the things that I said up here in my uh, brief remarks, what would be the things that you would disagree with and challenge me on? Uh, I'm not a deadhead, for one. Okay. <laughs> I am. That just leaves more room for me at the concerts. <laughs> I'm not 6'11", either. Oh, yeah, but you're good looking, though. <laughs> that I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Moss, what are you looking for in a patient? What do you want the patients to do in, in response to the, to the things you're trying to do? You know, like I said, it's, uh, my job is, is a short part, and uh, your, the patient's job is really the longer part. So it's that motivation. It's that, uh, really, it's just a willingness to want to get better. And I do see people that have, like you said, waited too long. They've gone off the deep end. And... Um, you know, really have almost given up, and it's very hard to fix that. And, uh, so, you know, uh, we, we can fix your back. Uh, we can't necessarily fix the rest of your life, but we're going to try to get you there. You know, at least give you the building blocks to try to, to, try to go that way. And uh, so all I ask, you know, from patients is uh, we work together. It's a team sport, uh, just like basketball, just like hockey. Canada. <laughs> Hot hockey, come on. Montreal Canadiens are playing Diego, against the Rangers. In San Diego, we use our ice for margaritas. Come <laughs> on. So it's a, it's a team sport, and you know we have a great team here. Uh, there's myself, uh, Lindsay Smith is our, uh, our PA. We have physical therapists. We have everyone that works together to try to give everybody the best chance uh, to recover, but you've got to really make that commitment on your own. And let's talk about that commitment and how you can help yourself. We've spoken tonight about the team and the value of the group, and there's an incredible team here, but never discount the value of the team in what you're doing in terms of the climb back up on the mountain. because. It is incredibly hard to swim laps by yourself. It is incredibly hard to push steel and lift weights by yourself. But if you go to a gym where other people are working together, think about it on a basketball team. If you're playing and you're not having a good game, somebody else is going to set the pace. If you're on a bike group and you're out there riding and you're not feeling strong today, somebody else will come out and take the lead. When you go down to a pool, the pool I go to, it opens at 4.30 in the morning. It stays open until 11 o'clock at night. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people in it all day long just living this whole world of spine health, just working out constantly, moving, stretching, working on that extension, getting those muscles there and in the front doing your sit-ups, your sit-to-stands, your rolling chairs, your hip flexors and your hip extensions and all the different things that will allow you to have a chance to have spine health. And the same thing in the weight room. Have the music on, have video on the back. I always tell the people who I'm working with, when you're feeling really bad, don't watch television. The television sell, sells fear and death. Listen to music, be with other people who are trying to get better, and when you're really up against it, go and volunteer at one of three places. Go and volunteer at a children's cancer hospital, go and volunteer at a VA hospital, and go and volunteer at a homeless shelter. And they're easy to find because they're everywhere. And you'll walk out of that place after you come in and volunteer spending a day doing anything, whether it's mopping the floors, cleaning the toilet, serving the food, during the laundry, whatever it is, you'll walk out of there and say, I'm the luckiest person on earth. Now, one of the things that makes me really lucky is that I'm sick all the time. I'm always sick of something or somebody. <laughs> but I know what makes me better. And there's three things that make me better. Exercise, movement, doing whatever I can. Even if it's just walking outside in the sun for a few steps. 
being a part of a team, being around other people. My ultimate teammate is my wife, our children, our family, but I've got other teammates as well. And then finally is the music, the music that makes you happy. Immerse yourself in a world of happiness, in a world of hope, to give yourself the chance to feel better. Do everything you can to make yourself feel better. Happiness, the ultimate pillar of life. What was your, what was your question, I'm sorry? <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I enjoyed the, uh, the slideshow. The slideshow, the, the wonderful athleticism. When do you think they'll bring down the short shorts that you wore as, as a stick? <laughs> Course. The baggy clothes generation, I'm not of the tattoo generation, and I am of the generation that I want to win. And for me to win, that means I have to get from here to there first. And that's what UConn Health provides you, is that chance, okay, we can give you the help, we can give you the tips, we can give you the knowledge, the structure, the foundation, but you have to do everything yourself to give yourself the chance to get there first. And so why would I wear something that was so big and so baggy and so heavy that it's going to slow me down? Look at the track and field guys. Look at Usain Bolt. That guy wears a skin-tight uniform. Look at the swimmers. They don't wear anything out there. And, you know, look at the bicycle racers. They're wearing skin-tight stuff and just the minimum amount of stuff possible. And I look at the basketball players, which is all about speed and quickness and getting there first, and they're wearing, like, something that you would... I don't know where you would wear that stuff. I mean, maybe Snoop Dogg would wear it someplace, but I don't know where anybody that I know would wear it anywhere. I love the short shorts. Sean, you have some of the question over there? Yeah. How long is too long? I've been living with uh, back pain for 29 years. and That's too long. Yeah. I mean, it, it comes and goes. The spasms, the, what, you know, the um, can't walk, the episodes. What's, right. what's really too long? I'm still very active. I think it's 28 yeah. years is too long, right? Yes. <laughs> you will know, as I knew with my knee. I always thought I was going to get better. I thought I was fine. When I first walked in and saw my spine doctor, the very first day, he looked at me and he said, I can fix your spine, but until you fix your knee, we're just wasting our time. I didn't believe him. I didn't trust him. And it wasn't until just a year and a half ago that I was in church on New Year's Eve, and everybody else was having the time of their life. And I couldn't move. I couldn't get up and down. And the worst part of it was that my spine was already all better, but because my leg was crooked, it was, I could start to feel it that night coming up into my spine. And I didn't have the balance and the symmetry that I need. So what you have to do, number one, is find the doctor. Come in and interview these guys. Ask them every question in the book. They, they have assistants that work with them too when they're too busy. Get their home phone numbers. Get their email address and ask them every question. Make, call me up. And, and, and make a list. Okay, am I going to the gym every day? Am I in the pool every day? Am I pushing that steel every day? Am I riding my bike to pull it all together? Am I doing everything I can to give myself the chance that this pain is going to go away? And then when you're doing that and it's still not going away, you'll know. But 28, I mean, I lived with mine for 35. I, I thought I was going to be fine. I thought I was going to get better. But then I couldn't, and Cortez, the dog, ate my food, and that was really, really bad. Chris? Yes. It was told that I had a uh, messed up back, um, and I was told that I can't do a fusion. Is there another procedure that could be done? That's, yeah, so you're asking are there other procedures besides fusions. That's, that's a hard question to answer with not, without knowing the specifics of your problem, you know. Um, so uh, I think it's something you have to look at. There, there are a lot of options out there. There's uh, decompressions, discectomies, and fusions, and there's, you know, a whole array of things um, that can be done. So uh, I, I think it's the type of thing that, you know, make an appointment, give us a call, and uh, we'll take a look at things. No injury is like any others. This is your injury. This is your specific problem. You're going to come in. You're going to stand there. He's going to look at you and say, okay, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. Maybe we can do this. And then you figure it out in conjunction with the doctor. Sean? Hi, um, I've had three back surgeries, the last one being a spinal fusion. I've tried 
everything that they've asked me to do as far as pain management. I mean, uh, since 2008 up until this point, the last one being like the dural stimulator, which uh, failed because they poked my membrane. Um, and my diagnosis at this point is like a failed back surgery. So I'm just, I just want to know for myself is, do I have any alternatives? It's a good question. And again, it, it's sort of a, it's a tough question to answer. Uh, you know, I, I, the other gentleman said, what's our success rate? So if, at least in my mind, I'd like to think it's 85, 90%. Unfortunately, it leaves 10% of people uh, that may not be as good as they'd like to be. Um, it's difficult to say again, whatever the, uh, with what the specific situation is in your case. And again, it's one of those things where you need to be evaluated and uh, take a look at things. And you know, uh, we pride ourselves of being honest. If we can't help you, we won't try um, uh, if we don't think there's a good success. But it's one of those things where we really have to take a look at the individual situation once again and uh, see if there is something we can do for you. And is the phone number of this hospital 800-535-6232? Is that the number of this hospital, or is that the number of the Better Way Back? That's right. That's the call center. That's the call center for this hospital? Yes. 800-535-6232. 800-535-6232. You call up and say you were at this seminar, the Better Way Back, the Spine Deal, Bill Walton, Dr. Moss, Dr. Onyuke, say, my back is killing me. And I need some help right now. And, and please, what is your home address? <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the keys in life is to making people say no. And, you know, you're going to be, we were up today visiting the patients in the hospital in the, who had just had the surgery. And they were hurting, because you, you, you do hurt after the surgery. I mean, this is not something you... You walk in, it's, it's not like, anybody here have cataract surgery? Anybody ever had cataract surgery where you walk in and you walk out of there 10 minutes later and you're like fine immediately? That's not what this is like, no. So, For that number, by the way, you all have, a pa in your package, you have uh, pictures of some handsome gentlemen and uh, there are a bunch of numbers on their website and so the information, you don't have to, you don't, none of us have as good a memory as Bill, so uh, there is information on there. Yes, question. I was impressed that your surgery was eight hours. I mean, did, what levels did you have? There's a multiple. I just had one level fusion. Really? L23. I've got four incisions, and I don't know what they did other than I've seen my x rays. Yeah. And Dr. Moss and Dr. Onyuke would be able to explain more what they did. They know Dr. Garfin, but things have gotten a lot better in the last five and a half years. And what Dr. Garfin, he kept coming out during the surgery to tell my wife, this has taken longer than we thought. We didn't realize how big he was. <laughs> yes, qu more questions. In the back there. Yeah, or, yeah, I hear you just fine. Sure. Like me. Yeah. So, no, we, we do. Like, like I said, I probably only operate on one out of Dr. Moss, can you repeat the question just so they sure. can get on the video? Yeah, no, so the question was, uh, um, you astutely pointed out that on my sort of ladder of treatment, really surgery is way at the end, and there was a bunch of things that we did before, medications, exercise, physical therapy, uh, injections, all those things. 100%, like I said, about a, uh, I only operate probably one of 20 people that walks through my door. So uh, the rest of those people we try to give good advice to. We, pre we prescribe physical therapy. We uh, prescribe uh, anti-inflammatories. I have a colleague, Dr. Joseph Walker, who's a physiatrist, who's uh, uh, really a whiz at spinal injections. And so we really, um, sometimes what we'll try to do is when, again, we'll assess you, we'll try to guide you to the right direction where you need to go. That may be us, that may be somebody else, but again, we will try to get you to that direction that you need where you are on that ladder, depending on where, where, you, where you are when you show up. And UConn Health provides all those services, right? The yeah. Phys we, we, physical therapy, direction for massage therapy, for acupuncture. Yeah, we have, uh, we, we have most of the services available here, and if not, certainly we know people in the area that we trust and uh, we'll send you to. 
Here. Chris? Yes, I was wondering, I've been doing this for several years now and did several therapies that all the acupuncturists had a minute. And all the doctors said, no, but, but. Hang on, we're going to get you to the microphone again. <laughs> this one works better. Thank you. But I wonder, is age the reason that they're, they're saying that for me? Because I'm 80, so, and I've had a stroke and stuff. Does that all come into consideration that? that a surgery would be very dangerous for me. So if I understand, the question is that you've been through all this treatment and you still have pain yes. and people have told you you can't have surgery. Yeah. Correct? The, the, the minor one they said below, you know, they wouldn't go up into the, the upper disc right. area. And so, but I have done all the acupuncture surge, and therapy and uh, no, oh, it's, that's a good question. You know, uh, age in itself doesn't really mean very much these days. You know, uh, I've operated on uh, eight-year-olds and 88-year-olds. Oh, okay. um, I'm lower than that. <laughs> so uh, I think the record is 99, not in spine surgery, but, in, but um, so, you know, age itself doesn't mean anything. But once again, we always have to weigh the risks and the benefits of surgery. You know, um, if you have a lot of medical problems, you've had strokes, heart attacks, things like that, maybe it's just too dangerous to have the surgery. That's what um, I was wondering. That's a difficult uh, thing to tell patients, obviously, and we try not to, to do that. If there's something we can do to optimize your medical health before surgery, we certainly can try to do that. Um, and that's a frank discussion that you need to have with your doctor and uh, really understand the risks and the benefits. And sometimes you take those risks. Uh, when we think the benefits do away them, sometimes we say, you know what, the risk is too high and uh, you're better off continuing with how things have been. That's a tough conversation, but one we have to have sometimes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if I may, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on my operations to help yes, answer the questions. Uh, I was told in my first operation, if I had gone in five years sooner, I, had a I would have had a very simple operation. Waiting that extra five years made a very difficult operation. And in that operation, I lost three pints of blood, which had to be replaced, of course. And uh, I spent five days in ICU and three days in the hospital. Then I went home. With Dr. Moss's operation, I believe he told me I used less than a cup, lost less than a cup of blood, and I was out of the hospital and home in two days. So it's, it's huge to go early and even huger to go to Dr. Moss. Lou, what's your wife's name there? June. Oh, I June. Just, Hello, I, June. Hi. I just want to thank Dr. Moss for giving me my husband back. Excellent. I mean, he is outstanding. And thank you. Very good. Here's a question right up here. <laughs> yep. Okay, we'll try that. Hi, I just wanted to hear from, from Lou or Sandy if, um, more about the difficulties right at the beginning so you have a better idea, we have a better idea what we would be in for if we had the surgery. We're talking about right after surgery. Why am I, okay, good thing it's working. Um, well, you know, while you're in the hospital, you, you've, you're getting good pain control, so, but you get up and move around. And, um, you know, the more you can start to move around in the hospital, it, it, the easier it is when you go home. And, um, you know, they decide whether you are going to be able to manage at home alone. I mean, it, it, a lot of it, you have to look into what type of house you have, what kind of stairs you have, that kind of thing uh, at home. And uh, so what kind of help you're going to need and what's available. So some people go to rehab uh, after surgery, right, Dr. Moss? Yeah, certainly uh, some patients do. And that, that makes a lot of sense if you don't have the help at home and you can get the intensive help there. And, uh, but the idea is once you can get back into your own home, you start to you know, do your daily activities. And um, you, it really is, it's gonna take one day at a time and before you know it, you're starting to move around and do a lot of things that you did you know, prior to surgery. Uh, you still need pain control at home. I think I was on Percocet, you know, with decreasing amounts, I was on it for probably almost a month. But then it was like, okay, it's time to stop this now. And I, you know, was fine afterwards. I didn't even realize that I probably didn't need it anymore. It's just kind of a crutch. You think you need it. 
And, um, but in the beginning, you definitely do. I don't know, does that help answer your question? Hello? Uh, with Dr. Moss's operation, I was only in for two days. The day after the operation, I was walking with a walker, and I was climbing uh, two steps, because I have two steps to get into my house. I want to make sure I could do that. And uh, after that, I just went home. And uh, it's very important that you have somebody uh, that really help, really could help you good. And my wife is, she's the best. Way to go, June. We okay. love you, June. Well done. OK, very good. Well, thank you very much. Um, did she want to say something? No, well, good. All right. So I think it's My very- phone number 619-890-9085. 619-890-9085. And you don't have to leave long messages. Just say, it's June and my back is killing me, or it's June and my husband is really mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Um, what I just wanted to highlight. There was one question down here in the front. There here. was? Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, the two hands gentlemen in the uh, brochure, um, I would just like to know um, how does one know whether you know, we should be contacting the orthopedic surgeon and they would help us better, or the neurologist, and they could the help us better? The neurosurgeon, yes. <laughs> Very good. Well, the, the, the common theme, of course, as you know, is spine surgery. So. We are all spine surgeons, whether we're orthopedic or neurosurgeon. So um, it doesn't matter, truly. That's why we have the program, and that's why we are collaborators, and that's why we work together. So we are, we either often, one, any, you know, any one of us will be fine. We often do surgeries together. Okay. I mean, we really work as a team. So uh, as uh, Dr. Nuke said, uh, you know, I think you want to find a surgeon who does a lot of spine surgery, whether they're a neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon, at this point, doesn't matter much. You want to find the best surgeon you can. <laughs> For what you the have. way I went and found John Wooden, the way I went and found Larry Bird and Red Auerbach. That's that, right. That made a big difference in my life, I tell you. And, it, and the way that Jim Gray found my spine surgeon. That's right. So just to highlight again and capitulate is that um, the, the procedure we showed today is only obviously one aspect of spine surgery with specific indications. Don't leave here thinking that this is the one procedure that can cure all spine problems. Mm -hmm. Clearly not. Okay. There's in fact nothing that would completely cure any spine, any spine problem. So, but we found that this minimally approach um, surgery can help um, because if we do it the traditional way, it's probably gonna be a bigger surgery, longer surgery. So this was basically a shortcut to have, like Dr. Moore said, maximum outcome with minimal approach. So just one aspect, one technique. So on that note, though, I would like to thank Dr. Bill Walton for coming today and sharing his experience with us. And Dr. Isaac Moss, who really has popularized this procedure here at the Health Center. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming up to share the experience with us. And have a good night.